Praise Yahweh. All right, our message today is going to come from the from the book of Ephesians and chapter 2. And um, this is a, a chapter that has caused a tremendous amount of confusion um, among a lot of people. And I want to go over this chapter with you today. Uh, I think it's a very important thing that we all get a hold of. And even if you may have heard something like this before, I encourage you to, to hear it again because we've got to give answer for the hope that's in us. And uh, we also need to understand who we are. There is a real identity crisis in the church today. We need to understand who we are in the Messiah, Yahshua. And once we understand who we are, then we understand what we're supposed to do. And so the study title for today's message is Ephesians 2, Abolishing the Law in His Flesh. And we're going to attempt to address that question for you today. And, um, and many, pe- many people believe that, that parts of His Word are abolished and no longer necessary or needful to follow. And we're going to examine this chapter uh, from Paul's writings, which many people try to use to suggest that. And um, if anybody has a Bible nearby, I'd like you to open it to chapter 2 because we're going to examine this chapter in full detail today. And uh, this is a very, very troubling scripture uh, for those who read the New International Version. Um, And so if you have an NIV uh, somewhere nearby, uh, take a look at it. And you'll notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. I'd like you to read this with me. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 Go ahead and switch over there, Kaliah. And um, for some reason the clicker is not working. There we go. <laughs> it says, in your international version, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law, with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both them to Elohim through the tree, which he by which he put to death their hostility. So Ephesians two fifteen, look at that very closely, verse fifteen, it says that he has abol- by abolishing in his flesh the law, with its commandments and regulations. Now, this is an awful translation of Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm not just saying this. Um, There's no translation I know of quite like this. And um, and if I was to 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 get a uh, a Christian next next to me who uh, believed that the law was abolished, and he all we'd have to do is point out that um, Ephesians 2.15, it says right there in plain sight, abolish the law with its commandments and regulations. And how can you argue with that? Except that to say, is that what other translations say or they say something a little bit different? And you're going to find out today that they say something a little bit different. But listen, we need to have mercy on those who believe the law is abolished because the New International Version in the English, the English translation um, is very, very popular, and now they're saying it is outweighed and outpopularized the King James version. And so now, the New International Version is even more popular than the King James. It has surpassed the King James as the the most sold Bible, English Bible, in the world. And so. When they come across this scripture, what are they going to think? Of course, they're going to think the law has been abolished because that's what their Bible says. And so um, let's let's have a little mercy, and uh, because these these translations create this impression, and uh, I definitely 
uh, I feel bad for whoever is uh, responsible for that translation because um, that is a very, very serious thing to, uh, to say. Anyway, now if you read the preface of your New International Version, they're going to tell you there that it's not a literal translation. They call it dynamic equivalence. In other words, they're going to take what they read in the Greek or the Hebrew, and based on what they think it's saying, they're going to reword the whole thing to make it easier for you to understand. So they're going to read it. It's not quite a paraphrase. It's a little different than a paraphrase, but they're conveying what they would call thought-for-thought thought translation rather than a word-for-word word translation. And so they're, they're taking this, and they're... And they're thinking, okay, this is what it's saying to us. And then they're going to reword it to make it easier for you and try to convey what they think the Greek or the Hebrew is saying based on what, basically on what they think it's saying. Rather than just giving you, okay, this word means that, this word means this, and leave, leave to you the way the, to interpret the scriptures. They're going to interpret it a little bit for you to make it easier for you. So obviously when you have thoughts in a thought-for-thought thought translation, sometimes our own thoughts can get in the middle there of what Yahweh is trying to say. And so please understand that the New International Version is not trying to be a literal translation. They are trying to be what they call a dynamic equivalent translation. And it's quite dynamic as you can see. So if you're looking for a more literal translation, then you're going to have to look maybe at the King James, the New King James. Um, some have suggested the New American Standard is literal. Um, I've got a few problems with that translation, but um, but they are more literal word for word. And, um, and sometimes word for word translations are harder to understand because you have to think and pray and seek to understand it. But what the NIV did is they took all the passages that were hard to understand and kind of smoothed them over based on how they're able to figure them out. And uh, if they thought it wasn't, if they thought it was too hard to figure out, well, then they put this little this little note at the bottom that says the meaning is uncertain. So anyway, uh, they apparently didn't think the meaning was uncertain here. They felt pretty sure that the law was abolished, but that's because of the theology that they convey. And so what is the true meaning of these verses in Ephesians 2? What is the context? What's Paul trying to say? Would Paul, the same man who said that we're supposed to be subject to the law of Yahweh, also say that the law of Yahweh has been abolished? That's, that would beg the question. When we, read, when we read a Romans, from the book of Romans, chapter 8, Verse 6. It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against Elohim. For it is not subject to the law of Elohim, nor indeed can be. Now, notice here, the carnal mind is a mind that leads to death. A spiritual mind is a mind that leads to life and to peace. And here it says the reason why. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hatred against Elohim, Yahweh. For it is not subject to the law of Elohim. In other words, the carnal mind is at variance or it has hatred toward Yahweh because it's not being subject to or obedient to the law. So on one hand, we have a scripture verse here. It clearly says, we don't want to have a carnal mind, right? We don't have a spiritual mind. That we should be subject to, subordinate to, obedient to, and, and to the law of Yahweh. But then on the other hand, on the NIV translation, and only in the NIV, as far as I know, it appeared to be saying that this law has been abolished. Well, if the law has been abolished, why do we need to be subject to it? Wouldn't make any sense. 
And so would Paul, the same man who said the law of Yahweh, has not been made void through faith, also say that the law is null and void? Romans chapter 3, verse 31 says, Do we make do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, this word um, void is an interesting word. And um, I think I've got the... Uh, Nope, I don't have it. Anyway, the word void, let me look it up in my little Bible program here. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. The word translated void comes from 2673, which means to be rendered idle, unemployed, inactive, and operative. And that same word we're going to find out, is also used in Ephesians chapter 2. But I'll get to that a little bit later here in the uh, in the broadcast. All right, so, so if the law is abolished, why would you have to be obedient to it? Why would you want to, why would it say that you need to be subject to it? And the word that's translated established here in Romans 3.31 if you look that up in a Strong's lexicon, it means to cause or make to stand. To stand. So the law stands. It's not, it's not abolished. And so what in the world is going on here? Because on one hand, we have verses that indicate the law has been done away with. We don't have to be obedient to it. And on the other hand, we have verses that say the law is not void and that the law, we need to be subject to it. And these are questions that should naturally arise because otherwise we have Scripture contradicting itself. And so what is the true answer here? So what we're going to do today is we're going to read the book of Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 8 and we're going to go through this verse by verse because I don't want to take anything out of context. We don't want, we don't want to allow anything to contradict anything else. So... We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2. And let's start at verse 8 and see what we find. It says in verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Elohim, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so context here, Paul is speaking of our salvation and the importance of recognizing that it's not our own works that save us. Rather, it's the blessed gift of Yahweh's grace. And that's so true. Because if it was really true that our works could save us, we could boast that we achieved salvation by our own power and by our own strength and by our own righteousness. And in fact, we could say that we, we could save ourselves and we don't even need the Messiah if it was really true that our works could save us. But the truth is we must be humble in the eyes of Yahweh and we must admit that we are in a wretched condition and confess that we have no choice but to trust, trust completely in the grace of Yahweh through Yahshua, the Messiah. The salvation that we have received is not by our own works. It is by His grace that we are saved. Now today, many people believe that if a person tries to keep the Sabbath day, or if he seeks to refrain from eating pork, then automatically he is seeking to be saved by his own works through the observance of those commandments. But that can't be true. How can the observance of a commandment automatically make you fallen from grace? If you tried to honor your parents, or if you tried to refrain from idolatry, or if you sought to keep yourself from adultery, it, would anybody ever say that you're trying to earn your salvation? No. But the minute you keep a Sabbath day holy, or if you keep other certain commandments that are not popular today, 
then whammo. You're trying to earn your salvation, trying to be saved by your own works, and you're falling from grace. Why is that? Does that really make any sense? I don't think so. You see, there is no scriptural support for such when you take certain Bible verses out of the scriptures and say, well, if you keep these commandments over here, you're trying to be saved by your own works. But if you keep these commandments over there, well, you're just doing the things you're supposed to do. You see, you could try you could actually try to earn your salvation by keeping any commandment. A man could say, Well, I honor my parents all my life, therefore I should be saved. I tried to be a good person, therefore I should be saved. But the truth is it's not the keeping of any specific commandment that brings you to a point of earning your salvation. You could keep You could claim any commandment in the entire Bible and say, well, because I kept that commandment over here, I think Yahweh will accept me. I don't really need this this Messiah thing going on. And so it's not the fact that you're keeping the Sabbath day or certain other commandments that other people think are Jewish commandments only that is causing you to fall from grace. It's just this theology that they have. And um, nobody's going to fall from grace just by keeping a commandment. In fact, it's, it's evidence of our faith that we walk in obedience to his commandments. And so I want to reiterate that we cannot be saved by any keeping of any one command. It's only through the grace of Yahweh. However, because we have been repentant, because we've chosen to turn away from sin, we should seek to keep the commandments. And that should be our goal, not because we're going to... um, earn our salvation by it, but because we love Yahweh and we want to please Him and we want to bless Him and serve Him and love Him the way He wants to be loved, not by the way we think love is. And so because we love Yahweh, and this is what I shared last week, we want to keep these commandments that have to do with loving Him. And the Sabbath is one of them. So, Just because we keep additional commandments that most of nominal Christianity does not keep, that does not mean that Yahweh's grace is missing from our life. And I can tell you right now, I don't care how long you've been keeping whatever commandment you've been keeping, nobody can be saved by those commandment-keeping things that you do. Nobody. No one is saved by their obedience. But because we have repented, Obedience should be a part of our life, an important part of our life. All right. So, a scriptural response to Yahweh's grace is repentance and faith in the Messiah. An unscriptural response to Yahweh's grace would be to continue breaking the commandments that you always broke. Okay. All right. We are created in the Messiah Yahshua unto good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. We're going to continue to read here. And it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahshua for good works, which Elohim prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so even though we are not saved by works, we are created for good works. And we are his workmanship. We are the creation of Yahweh. And so I think that's a point often missed. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith. Because there's not any commandment we can keep that will ever make up for the sins that we've committed. But we need to remain humble. We cannot achieve salvation by the keeping of any specific commandment. We have to have faith that Yahweh will place his righteousness in us and will cleanse us through Yahshua, the Messiah, so that we are able to be saved. And when he does that, 
we are indeed a new creation, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. It's not switching. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, since we are a new creation, we're not that Adam sinner man anymore, then we need to act like it. Because we are his workmanship, we are created in Messiah Yahshua unto good works, and Elohim, the Elohim has before ordained that we should walk in those good works and maintain those good works until the time of Yahshua the Messiah. After all, when we maintain good works, that's the biblical response to salvation. There's nothing more wrong with affirming that constantly, that we must maintain good works. There's nothing wrong with that. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in Elohim should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And so it's not a bad thing. The emphasis is being placed on good works and maintaining good works. In fact, it is expected. And as long as we understand the context of that, that our good works are not able to save us. And when I say works, I mean the keeping of Yahweh's commandments, not just certain commandments that th certain people think are Jewish. But any commandment. After all, since we're a new creation, it's no longer we who live, it's Yahshua who lives in us, then we ought to walk just as he walked. In in, in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 4, it says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. No, I didn't say that. The scriptures said that. If you think that you know him and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. That's what it says. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of Elohim is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. By what? By this you know that you're in him but because you keep his word. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So if there's ever any question as to whether you should keep a certain commandment, all you need to do is look at what he did. The results of us being a new creation is that we will not lie and claim to know him while disobeying his commandments as a habitual practice. We should see the results of being a new creation is that we walk as Yahshua walked. How did he walk? Well, we know he kept every one of Yahweh's commands. And Yahweh desires that we would maintain good works, walk in them, and affirm this constantly. We must be careful to maintain good works. It's not a bad thing to affirm that constantly. That's a good thing. As long as we start with the good news, that's not by our righteousness, but by his righteousness dwelling in us. Through Yahshua the Messiah, in whom is truth and righteousness. And that's how we receive salvation. Now, another implica implication of his workmanship is mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read it in context here. And it says, continuing to read, We are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahshua for good works, which Elohim prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without Elohim in the world. Now, please, pay close attention here to what's being said. It says 
that being a Gentile is something that occurred in time past. It says, you were once Gentiles in the flesh. That means at one time you were a Gentile. But now, see, at that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You used to be a Gentile. You used to be a stranger from the covenants of promise, having no hope, without Elohim in the world. You were in a hopeless state. Why? Because you were a Gentile. You were a stranger from the covenants of promise. You see, we're not considered Gentiles anymore once we are in the Messiah Yahshua because it's no longer we who live. It is the Messiah who lives in us. Now, if the Messiah lives in you, then you are Israel. You are not a Gentile anymore. See, many today are seeking to distance themselves from Israel because they believe they're a Gentile. But according to this scripture, there are several things that are no longer true for a Gentile believer in the Messiah, and that is that they're a Gentile anymore. The second thing is that you used to be an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, but that's not true anymore either. The third thing is you used to be a stranger from the covenants of promise, but that's not true anymore either. You're no longer a stranger. You're no longer an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, and you're no longer a Gentile. It used to be you had no hope, but now you do have hope. It used to be that you were without Elohim, but now you do have Elohim. You getting this? That is the work of Yahshua dwelling in you. So for any believer who still claims he's a Gentile and therefore he's not a part of the commonwealth of Israel and still claims he's a stranger from the covenants given to Israel, Anyone who is saying that they are these things, you know what they're doing? They are rejecting the workmanship of the Messiah. They are rejecting the good news that it is no longer we who live. It's Yahshua and Israelite who lives in us. Do you understand this? They say that we're rejecting the Messiah because we keep the commandments. And that's only for Jews. But the reality is, when you say that you're, not, you're, that you're not a Jew in the Messiah Yahshua, you're rejecting the work of the Messiah. Just the opposite is true. And so because we are Israel, then we need to live like Israel. That's right. Because we're not Israel anymore. And the more you say you're not Israel the more you're rejecting the work of the Messiah dwelling in you. We understand this. I'm not talking about replacement theology. I'm talking about being grafted in to the olive tree. Okay? We are now Israel. And so, another verse for this, in case you're wondering... Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. It says, If you are the Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, there's no, no difference between you saying that you're Abraham's seed and you saying that you're Israel. There's no difference. It's one and the same. So Gentiles are transformed into Israelites through the blood of the Messiah. And so if you are Abraham's seed, I'm sorry, if you are the Messiah's, then you are Abraham's seed. All right. That's his workmanship. Gentiles are transformed into Israelites. And that's an awesome work. So let's continue reading here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, at that time that you were without Messiah. <clears throat> Can I move that over there, Kaliah? You were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without Elohim in the world. But now, in Messiah Yahushua, you who once were far off have been brought near 
Brought near to what? To the commonwealth of Israel. By the blood of the Messiah. That's the work of the blood. Not only that you're cleansed from sin, but that you're brought near to these covenants that were given to Israel. The covenants of promise given to the children of Abraham. So, that's the blessing. See, the life is in the blood, right? And it's Yahshua's blood that cleanses us. And Yahshua's life is now in us. We are covered by the blood of the Lamb. That means Yahshua's life is now in us. And Gentiles have taken on a new heritage, a new identity. No longer are Gentiles aliens and strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. No longer are Gentiles strangers from the covenants of promise. But now are brought near by what? By the life of the Messiah dwelling in you. By the blood of the Messiah. All those years you heard, Oh, it's under the blood, under the blood, under the blood, under the blood. Cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, here's another work of the blood. Now you're an Israelite. How about that? Isn't that an awesome work? Because it's no longer we who live. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It is no, I've been crucified with the Messiah. It's no longer I who live, it's Messiah lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so since Yahshua now lives in you, you now walk as he walked. A new creature, a new creation. We're now part of the commonwealth of Israel because Yahshua is Israel. He lives in you. Therefore, you're Abraham's seed because Yahshua lives in you. That's why we're the body of Messiah to begin with. And so what I see happening today, what's happened over 2,000 years of tradition today, brothers, is the church has an identity crisis. There's an identity thief who has stolen their identity. And our identity in the Messiah is that we are Israel. And the thief wants to drag you back into the Gentile mindset again. And so there has been identity theft. And we need to understand what our identity is. We need to get off this I'm a Gentile kick and identify ourselves with Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant. Now this is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 as being applicable to us. A new covenant with who? Gentiles? No. A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of of Judah, both Israel and Judah. That's who the covenant is with. So how do we find our way into this covenant being Gentiles? It's only through the blood of the Messiah. That's how we find our way in. Because there's no mention of Gentiles here in this being parties to the covenant. And so we must become Israel to even be a party named in this new covenant that's given. Everybody talks about, oh, we're the New Testament church. Well, that means you have to be Israel. If you want to be in a New Testament church, then you have to be Israel. Very different thing in the scriptures compared to what's commonly seen today, isn't it? Continue he reading here in verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. Now, what's he talking about? He says, I'm going to put my law in their inward parts. What is his law? 
Well, this is set back in the time of Jeremiah. When he says his law, what law is he talking about? Some brand new law they never heard of before? No. You see, the reason why the law of Yahweh is in your heart is because Yahshua is there. He's the living Torah. He's the living word which was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's not just the word of Yahweh in the book of Revelation or the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's the word of Yahweh in the book of Leviticus. He's the word of Yahweh in the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers and Genesis and Exodus. He's the word of Yahweh in the book of Isaiah. And the list goes on. And so all of Yahweh's word is in our heart. Not He didn't cancel part of it and say, oh, that's not in your heart now. No, his law is now in your hearts because Yahshua dwells in there. And so because of that, you will walk just as he did. You'll do the things that he did on the earth. And so according to the scripture, the new covenants with Israel and Judah. And so in order for a Gentile to be partakers of that, they've got to join themselves to Israel. And through receiving Yahshua, who will dwell in them, they will be able to walk according to the law of Yahweh, which is written in their hearts. And so, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 again. Now the Messiah, Yahshua, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. That is the work of the Messiah. Now, I guess I missed verse 14. But verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. That's what verse 14 reads. If you don't, if you have your Bible with you, I'm sorry I don't have it on the PowerPoint. I guess I missed that one. But um, verse 14, um, that's what it reads. Now, what is this middle wall of separation? Um, the middle wall of separation. Yahshua has made peace between Jew and Gentile. Do you see that? He's broken down this wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. He is our peace. Formerly, the Jews and Gentiles were not at peace with each other. But Yahshua is our peace. And he made both Jew and Gentile into one body. He is the one that broke down this wall of partition separating Jews from Gentiles. Thank you. Now, this wall of partition, there actually was a wall of partition on the temple grounds anciently. I want to read you a quote from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia where it talks about the temple area where the Jews uh, had forbidden the Gentiles to go any closer to the altar in the holy areas than an area called the court of the Gentiles. And so they had the court of the Gentiles. They were allowed to go there, but they were not allowed to go beyond that place into the holier areas. And it says, according to Encyclopedia here, it says in the year 1871, while excavations were being made on the site of the temple by the Palestine Exploration Fund, M. Clermont Ganu, or Gano discovered one of the pillars which Josephus describes as having been erected upon the very barrier or middle wall of partition to which Paul refers. This pillar is now preserved in the museum at Constantinople and is inscribed with a Greek inscription in capital or unsealed letters, which is translated as follows. No man of another nation to enter within the fence and enclosure round the temple, and whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death ensues. That's the middle wall partition and a sign that hung up there basically warning the Gentiles if they tried to go into this area, they would be killed. And so this barrier was set up, this middle wall of partition, through which the Gentiles could not draw near to the, to the Holy One of Israel. 
And the court of Gentiles is also where the oxen, the sheep, and the doves were sold, for Yahshua had overturned the tables of the money changers. He did this. Let's look at Mark chapter 11. It says, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Yahshua went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Now notice Yahshua's statement of intent that Yahweh had for his house, and that was for his house to be a house of prayer for all nations, not just for Jews, but for all nations. And this was Yahweh's will for the temple. Now, yes, they do have to make sure that the people who entered this area were not unclean, and they may have to quiz Gentiles who are entering in to make sure they were clean. But the Jews at that time believed just the fact that you were uncircumcised automatically made you unclean. That was not biblical. And so it was not Yahweh's will for this wall of partition to automatically exclude all Gentiles. Now when Yahshua said that the temple was to be a house of prayer for all nations, he was actually quoting from the prophet Isaiah. Where it says, and I don't have that I'll think on the PowerPoint, but it says that those the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to Yahweh Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 7. I guess I do have it up there. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, including the foreigners. Verse 7. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain, will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so it was Yahweh's will for the Gentiles in those days to come to the house, to keep his Sabbath day, to love his name, to hold fast his covenant. That's what it says there. And he would accept their burnt offerings and their sacrifices on his holy altar, even though they were they were foreigners, Gentiles. And so they could enter the holier place of the temple and bring their offerings, their sacrifices. This was not a, a Jew-only thing. All were invited. Anyone who wanted to join themselves to Yahweh could come. But... The Jews of that day said, no, 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 you're not going to do that. You have to first become a Jew through going through this lengthy proselytization process, and then you can come near. And so the Gentiles were not allowed to come near the altar. The Jews had set up a man-made law to forbid them from doing this. And they were so strong against the idea of Gentiles entering a temple area, they would kill anybody who would even try it. And in fact... This is what got Paul into trouble. In Acts chapter 21, verse 27, Paul is going to the holy places of the temple to bring offerings. He's ready to make sacrifices. If you look at the context, that's what it says. And in Acts 21, verse 27, it says, Now when the seven days, the seven days of purification for the Nazarite vow, were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. 
And see, they were so concerned he had defiled the temple by bringing Gentiles past this wall of partition. And so they're ready to kill him. You see, these man-made laws that kept Yahweh's house, well, even true, they didn't bring any Greeks in. They thought he did, but he didn't. These man-made laws, though, had kept Yahweh's house from being a house of prayer for all nations and blockading the Gentiles from being able to draw near to Yahweh in this way. And so, the thing that the people of that time period had forgotten is this, that when Yahweh chose Abraham's children to be a bearer of his will, to be committed to the oracles of Elohim, these oracles of Elohim were for all mankind, he said, to the Gentiles who keep my Sabbaths and join themselves to Yahweh. Come on, come to the house of prayer. See, his desire was that Israel would be a light to all nations so that all the nations of the earth would be drawn to him. He didn't just create sons of Israel. He created every man, woman, and child on the face of the, of the earth. And he didn't just choose Israel because he's some kind of a racist. He chose Israel because Abraham was a faithful man in his house, and he wanted to use that family to draw all men to himself. That's why he chose Israel. That's why he chose Abraham's children. And he said that. Remember the promise he made to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 16. We'll go there. And he said, By myself I have sworn, says Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, then he's going to give his son, see? Blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of, his, of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And that seed being spoken of there, if you read Galatians 3, is the Messiah. And so because Abraham was not even withholding his own son, Yahweh did not withhold his son. And because he did not withhold his son, that son of, of Abraham was actually offered. The only one worthy of being offered. And so it all starts with the family, didn't it? Yahshua is that seed of Abraham through all, all nations where we bless. Every one of us are imperfect. We are nothing he is everything. But Yahweh chose a land for Abraham's descendants to dwell, to be a light for all nations. If you look on a map, you'll notice Israel situated very uniquely geographically. You see, for the Gentiles to trade, the Gentiles of Africa to trade with the Gentiles of Asia, they had to pass through Israel. And for the Gentiles of Europe to trade with the Gentiles of Africa, they had to travel through Israel. And those traveling from Europe to southern Asia would also pass through the north side of Israel. And so Israel was a very key place through which many Gentiles would pass through and hear about Yahweh. And if Israel had been consistently obedient, they could have been that light. And sometimes they were. That would draw all men to him. But instead, oh, they set up laws and walls of exclusion. Now, if we truly understand Ephesians chapter 2, then we also need to understand the extent of the hatred and enmity between Jew and Gentile in this time period. And its effects can even be felt to this day. Just to give you an idea of, an idea of how much hatred there was for Gentiles by the Jewish people, look at this, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. says, this is when Yahshua was um, ready to read in the synagogue. And it says here, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened up the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Well, you, you will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Eliah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Eliah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, a woman who was a widow. So that's a Gentile. So he's telling them that there were many widows in Israel, but Eliah went to a Gentile. <laughs> and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And so he's pointing out that his own people don't accept him, but there's going to be Gentiles that do. Now, such was the enmity between Jew and Gentile in that time. It says, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. <laughs> now, obviously, there was a lot of hatred going on here. Very, very intense hatred. Enmity. A few comments like that and you're a dead man. And all you're doing is quoting scripture. And so no matter how well they know you, no matter the fact that you grew up in the area, you say something like this and you're in deep trouble ready to be killed. Forget going to trial. Forget anything. And so the Jews were taught not to keep company with Gentiles, obviously. The tensions were very high. Kepha, we see in Acts chapter 10, he needed to be corrected more than once on this very issue. In Acts chapter 10, Yahweh sent Kepha, Peter, a vision, which was intended to show him he needed to reach out to the Gentiles. Why does Yahweh want to reach out to the Gentiles? Because he loves them just as much as he does the Jewish people. He's not a respecter of persons. So the truth is, no matter who you are, no matter what human being you are, no matter what your heritage is, Yahweh is more respect for a man who doesn't know any better and sins than someone who does know better and sins. What's going on here in the times of Elisha the prophet is Yahweh is having mercy on the Gentiles because they're ignorant. Now there were rebellious men who knew better knew the will of Yahweh, and continued in their sins. But we see that a lot of times, if a Gentile had heard the good news, they would have repented, just like the time of Nineveh. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because these are Gentiles. They don't want them to repent. There was hatred going on. And that's something that the children of Israel had a hard time getting a hold of. So in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Kepha had to share something he never realized before, and that was, as a result of this vision that he had, he said, he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. See, the Gentiles were considered to be unclean. That's why I didn't want them to go to the temple. Even if they were clean, they weren't allowed to go to the temple because they're Gentiles, uncircumcised. 
And so they consider the Gentiles unclean just because of their uncircumcision. And so now you wonder why, why does it say unlawful there? Unlawful to go to one of another nation. Is there any, any commandment in the Bible that says that Jews, you can't go to the Gentiles? No. But the word translated lawful, unlawful here does not refer to Yahweh's law, but a violation of tradition. The Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature in the third edition says this term refers primarily not to what's forbidden by ordinance, but to violation of tradition or common recognition of what's seemly or proper. That's the definition in the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature in the third edition. So Yahweh used that vision to teach Kepha or Peter that he wanted to reach the Gentiles as well. He had already told them back in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19, the following. He said, switch over there. Yahshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so he told them to go to all nations, and they weren't doing it. And they were neglecting their duty to go to the all nations, and they were hanging around the temple area, focusing mainly on their ministry toward the Jews and their fellow countrymen. Now, I understand to the Jew first and then to the Greek, that's okay. But it was man, not Yahweh, who created laws and traditions which would forbid any Jewish man from keeping company with or going to one of another nation. You will not find a command anywhere in the Bible of any such thing. And so this Jewish doctrine of men had infected the disciples of Yahshua, and they even need to be corrected on this issue. And so when the Spirit of Yahweh fell upon the Gentiles in Acts chapter 11, it was a final proof that Yahweh could accept a Gentile even before he was circumcised and kept the Torah. And so Cephas said this was something that he had learned. And so Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35 it says, Kepha opened up his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that Elohim shows no partiality. But in every nation who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is something he didn't realize before. Now maybe he knew it, but he wasn't quite living it yet. And, he, and when he got accused in Acts chapter 11, he responded like this. Acts 11, 17 and 18. If therefore Elohim gave them, that's the Gentiles, the same gift, the Holy Spirit, that he gave us when we believe in the Master Yahshua, the Messiah, who was I that I could withstand Elohim? And when they heard this, they became silent, and they glorified Elohim, saying, Then Elohim has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Ha! Huh, something didn't know before. Gentiles can be granted repentance to life. See, mainstream teachers of Judaism were so obsessed with ceremonial cleanliness that they added hundreds of laws to the Torah, which Yahweh never intended or inspired. And Yahshua criticized them for that in Mark chapter 7, verse 3 through 9. It says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, might be Gentiles there, they do not eat unless they wash. And many other such things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Verse 5. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of Elohim, 
You hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of Elohim that you may keep your tradition. And so they're using these man-made traditions to keep themselves separated, which is not Yahweh's will, from the Gentiles, to the extent that they would say, oh, we might become unclean or common if we go around them. And so they have nothing to do with the Gentile. But Yahweh's law actually said not to mistreat the Gentiles, but to treat them the same as you would anybody else. And so it never says to avoid the Gentiles or refuse to go to them. In fact, it said just the opposite. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 21, pay, so, pay close attention, that's pretty important. Read this. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. He's pointing out they were, one time they were strangers too. Next verse. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you. And you shall love him as yourself. For you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And so the law of Yahweh actually says you treat him just the same as you do anybody else. You do not mistreat him. You do not oppress him. You act like he's one born among you. Because at one time you were like that too. And so it was never the will of Yahweh anywhere in the Torah this extreme separation that was going on in the first century. And we have to understand this context before we can understand fully what Ephesians 2 is actually saying. Now, Yahweh's law never creates hatred. As we can see from this verse, it creates love, doesn't it? Love him as yourself, stranger and neighbor. Love him as yourself. Keep this in mind. Because there's some myths, there's misconceptions out there, especially regarding Yahweh's law. Yahweh's law does not create hatred between men. It's very important to understand it because that's what's going on at the time in first century Judaism. There's a lot of hatred between Jew and Gentile. Understanding this will help us to understand this separation that was occurring between Jews and Gentiles as described in Ephesians and the reconciliation that we have in the Messiah Yahshua. Okay, so there were a separation and ordinances and laws and things that came out of that to prevent Jews from going to one or another nation. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. At that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yahshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, made both one, and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh, this is the correct translation, the enmity. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred. That is what he abolished, was hatred. Now, many people don't know that that's what the word enmity means, is hatred. Okay? Now, it says here, the enmity was abolished. He put that to death. Now, as a result of this hatred being abolished, Yahweh made both Jew and Gentile one people and broke down this middle wall of separation. Both Jew and Gentile are made one people because the hatred is now abolished. They can love each other. They're one. 
Now, this hatred was what inspired the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Go back to Ephesians 2 again. It says, having abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances that arose out of enmity, right? Okay. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's what he abolished. There were Now, this word, ordinance, um, is from the Greek word dogma. We'll get to that in a second. But he made himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Let's go back to Scripture there, Kaliah. It says, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. One new man. That's the Messiah Yahshua. That's the new man. And that he might reconcile them both to Elohim in one body through the staros, the stake, thereby putting to death the enmity. So he killed hatred and the commandments and ordinances of men that arose out of that, not the commandments of, of Yahweh. Strong's lexicon for this verse is translated the law of commands contained in dogmas. It says law. To, now, they, of course, they've got to put civil, ceremonial, ecclesiastical. But this means a decree. It's translated a decree or ordinance. Freiburg lexicon has as a fixed and authoritative decision or requirement, decree, command, as a fixed rule or set of rules, law, ordinance. <clears throat> Actually, a different lexicon. It's not Freiburg. Has dogma that which. Seems to one an opinion, a dogma, a public decree, an ordinance. And here's an example of where this word dogma is used. Now, remember, this is the word translated ordinance, ordinances. It came to pass in those days that a dogma went out from a man, Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. So there's an example of a, of a human ordinance, a decree. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, It came to pass those days a decree went out from Caesar. All the world should be registered. Acts 17, 7, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acted contrary to the dogmas of Caesar, saying there's another king, Yahshua. That's what, what's in the Greek there is dogmas. Now, it also speaks of the ap apostolic ruling when James and the rest of the apostles met together. <clears throat> this is what was said. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood, for Moshe has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read on the synagogues every Sabbath. Now, Acts 16, verse 4, I didn't put it up there, but Acts 16, verse 4 says, As they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees, the dogmas to keep, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Now, this is a case where a biblical dogma is given. But still, it is a decree given by men. And uh, this is the things that they were requiring the Gentiles to keep. Now, some have said, well, those things that they were required to keep were the only things in the law of Moses that were thought to be for Gentiles that we, he gave to the that he or for, for the Jews that he gave to the Gentiles. And they, 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 you get this impression by talking to some people that um, these things in Acts 15 were the only things that Gentiles had to do from the law of Moses. And that's not true. But you look at the four things that were forbidden 
And uh, look back here, Kali, at the uh, four things. Switch over to video. It says, abstain from things polluted by idols. Now, is that something that um, only Gentiles were expected to do? No. How about abstain from sexual immorality? How about that? No, that's something that all people should avoid. And abstain from things strangled and from blood. That was commanded in the very beginning when uh, Noah was allowed, was told that he could eat meat. Don't eat meat with the blood. And so those four things, these four abitions were not only forbidden at Sinai, but they were always forbidden. And Yahweh commanded Noah and all mankind not to drink the blood. And sexual immorality was condemned at Sodom and Gomorrah. And Yahweh obviously did not want men to, to uh, worship idols at any time in history. And so why do some people think that only these four dogmas are ceremonial laws somehow for some reason? There's no such thing as a ceremonial law. You catch that? There's no such thing as a ceremonial law. That's a concept invented by certain people who are trying to think of a way out of doing things that look Jewish to them. That's what it is. And so they put the law in these little boxes and they create civil, ceremonial, different laws and so on. Now it's true that there are certain things that were commanded for judges, certain things that were commanded for the priests. But there's nowhere it says ceremonial. And so we read here in Ephesians 2 that the Messiah is the one who causes all Gentiles to be brought near to the commonwealth of Israel. Right? And he's the one that caused the Gentiles to be brought near to the covenants of promise, having broken down this wall of partition and created a new man. And so there's certainly no good reason Gentiles the one to avoid anything that appears to be Jewish. After all, aren't they Jewish? Now that we are brought near the Messiah, aren't we all Jewish? Aren't we all Israel? And so they forgot that it was the Gentiles who needed to be brought near to Israel, not the other way around. So let's read this again in its entirety, this section of Ephesians 2, verse 11, just for clarity's sake. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. See, he said you're called uncircumcision, but you are circumcised, the Messiah. At that time, you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yahshua, you who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, not the law, the enmity. That is the law of commandments contained in decrees or dogmas that created the enmity to begin with, because Yahweh's law never did such a thing. Yahweh's law does not create enmity. It doesn't need to be abolished because it creates hatred. That is a false idea, a false doctrine. The law of Yahweh never created hatred between two men. It's supposed to create love, right? Just the opposite. Create himself a new man, one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to Elohim in one body through the tree, the staros, thereby putting to death the enmity. And so what are these dogmas? What are these dogmas of Ephesians chapter 2? Well, in order for these dogmas to fit the qualifications here, they have to be rulings and decrees of men, right? So um, it's true that the apostles made a decree in Acts 15, but it was a biblical decree. And so it can be a correct decree. It can be an incorrect decree. So the first qualification is it needs to be something unbiblical for it to be something abolished, right? And so these dogmas here created enmity and hatred because that's the thing that was created was hatred, right? Dogmas that create hatred. And these create a wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, something Yahweh never created. And the Messiah, 
he did away with all of these ordinances. We have a master who is a good shepherd, and he is not going to create hatred. It's man who does that. Ordinance is a decree of men, bring a lack of reconciliation, a lack of being at peace, and bring a lot of hatred all the way around. So <clears throat> now we look at Ephesians 2, everything in its proper place, everything in its proper order, everything in its proper context. It's a sin to create laws to separate men from one another and men from Yahweh. It's a sin. The sin that was abolished and was actually nailed to the tree because Yahshua became sin for us and he was nailed to the tree. So we are reconciled to Yahweh through the blood of the Messiah. And sin and death are abolished in Yahshua's flesh. And part of what hatred, is, part of what sin is, is hatred. Now, what is destroyed is decrees and dogmas of men. And we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Something else was destroyed too. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And so it's the body of sin that has been abolished. It's this sinful body. And when Yahshua was put to death on the stake, the body of sin was destroyed with him because we were impaled or crucified with the Messiah. So it's no longer we who live, it's Yahshua who lives in us. And these laws were sin. They separated man from his creator, and those sins were abolished in his flesh. Also, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, but now has been revealed... By the appearing of our Savior, Messiah Yahshua, and this is the point, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the good news. And so that's something else that was destroyed. Sin, our bodies, and death. All three of them were destroyed. And of course... Along with that, the hatred. And all the ordinances inspired by them when Yahshua died for us. Yahweh's law of love did not need to be abolished. The entire law and the prophets hang off the two great commands, which I shared last week with you all, to love Yahweh and to love our neighbor. There's no need to destroy something that is commanding us to love, right? Well, high on earth... Would we think such a thing? It's because of a new kind of hatred that rose between this time from the Gentile to the Jew. And through anti-Semitism and a fear of persecution by looking Jewish to their Gentile counterparts, they created this doctrine that the law has been abolished. That's where it came from. And so enmity created a problem where the, the, the Gentiles couldn't come to Yahweh in the first century, and now it creates another problem where the, the Jews are not coming to the Messiah because of this doctrine that the law has been abolished and that this new this Messiah has abolished the law. And so hatred's created all kinds of problems, hasn't it? There's no need to destroy something Yahweh has used to inspire us to love, but there is a great need to destroy the things which inspire hate 
and create things that lead to death. Yahushua did not have to take the law out of the way to reconcile Jew and Gentile. He had to take disobedience to that law, hatred, out of the way. He had to take sin out of the way to reconcile Jew and Gentile through the Messiah, Yahushua. And that's the point. Ephesians 2.16 And he that he might reconcile them both to Elohim in one body through the tree, thereby putting to death the enmity. Both Jews and Gentiles, brothers, are in need of reconciliation to Elohim because of the hatred, which is the underlying cause of all sin. The Jews who inspired ordinances of hatred in the first century obviously need a Savior just as much as any Gentile. And so both are reconciled to Elohim through Yahshua. And both are made one new man from the two. This one new man from the two is Yahshua who lives in us. And in him, the body of sin is destroyed along with the ordinances inspired by them. Now let's continue reading Ephesians 2. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit, by one spirit, to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of Elohim. Do you believe that? Do Gentile Christians today believe this? That we are his workmanship and because of those things we are now brought near. We are now Israel. Hallelujah. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Yahshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in Yahweh. Or in the master in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of Elohim in the Spirit. See, Yahshua is the chief cornerstone. That was predicted in the prophets. Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore says the Master Yahweh, Behold, I lay in Zion, Zion, a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, whoever believes will not act hastily. He's a chief cornerstone, while his apostles laid the foundation upon which the body of the Messiah stands today. We find a very beautiful picture of this, Revelation 21, 14. Now the wall of this city, of the New Jerusalem, had twelve foundations. Upon them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And so there it is, the foundation being spoken of Ephesians chapter 2 right there in the scriptures. Some might say, well, why, why is our foundation the apostles and prophets? It's almost like it says it used to be the law and the prophets, but now it's the apostles and the prophets. What happened to the law? Well, you know, I once met a man who actually rejected Paul's writings because he believed our foundation should be the law and the prophets. And it's the law that can only show us our sin. Well, the truth is, brothers, we cannot build our foundation on the law because that just shows us how sinful we've been. We can't build our foundation on something that shows us how awful we are. But we can build our foundation through Yahshua the Messiah. We can build our foundation on the Word which became flesh and dwelt among us, the living Torah, Yahshua the Messiah. John 1.14, as it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Also, Revelation 19.13 mentions that Yahshua is the word of Yahweh. Well, he's not just the word in the Old Testament or New Testament. He's also the word in the Old Testament. And since we placed our faith in him, the reason why we place our faith in him is because of the testimony that we have received through the apostles who speak about the Messiah through the prophets, which also speak about the Messiah. They are both our foundation. Without them, we wouldn't know Yahshua The law itself cannot be our foundation. If we put our foundation on the law, guess what? It's going to disappoint us on Judgment Day because I hate to tell you, but every one of you have broken it, including me. 
So it's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness dwelling in us as it spoke there in the beginning of Ephesians. By grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. And so as together as one body, brethren, Yahweh is building a dwelling place for his spirit because we are his temple, Jew and Gentile alike. We are all one. And when his spirit dwells in us, what are we going to do? Ezekiel 36, 27 says, I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's what the spirit of Yahweh will lead you to do. The temple of Yahweh needs to be a holy place, not an unholy place. If we're to be holy, we're going to keep the Sabbath day holy. If we're going to be holy, we're going to keep his name holy. If we are going to be holy, we're going to keep his holy feast days. And if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we will walk in his statutes, his judgments, and do them. We will not allow it to be defiled by abominable meats, yes, swine, and shellfish, and so on, because our bodies are the temple. Not to be smeared with pork and other abominable things like Antiochus Epiphany did on December 25th. Yes, it was on December 25th. If we are to be holy, we're not going to participate in unholy days to have their roots in idol worship. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 through 7, verse 1. We're going to be like Israelites, aren't we? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, verse 16 and 17. We're going to read through the next chapter. It says, What agreement has the temple of Elohim with idols? For you are the temple of the living Elohim, As Elohim has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. That's talking about Israel. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahweh Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness or uncleanness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. Holiness, a holy temple being built, a dwelling place for his spirit. And so having these promises, yes, Gentiles can cleave to and receive these promises given to Israel because, hey, he is writing the Corinthians here, isn't he? Having these promises, they were given to Israel. Let's start living like Israel. Let's start living like Israel is called to live. And and if you're going to do that, then you're going to cleanse yourselves not only spiritually, but also refrain from touching the unclean thing. Cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of flesh as well as spirit. And only then can we perfect holiness in the fear of Elohim. And since Gentiles are now fellow citizens and are no longer strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, Gentiles need to be sure that they're not still identifying themselves as Gentiles, but identifying themselves as Israel through Messiah. That's the work of Yahshua. Yahweh help us. And since Yahshua the Israelite lived according to the Torah, let's do the same. Let's imitate how he lived. He lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Yahweh. And we need to do the same. And so if he lives in us, let his life be manifest unto all who will look at us. Let his life be manifest in our life. The commandments he kept when he was on the earth, he wants to keep in us. Why would he change that? Didn't Paul say, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah? He's talking to Gentiles here. We know he kept the law. Imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. He's not going to change, brothers. Hebrews 13.8 Yahshua, the Messiah, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So brothers, sisters, friends, that same Yahshua that walked on the earth 2,000 years ago. He wants to be the same person.
person in you. Don't change him. In fact, you can't change him. And there's nothing in Ephesians chapter 2 that changes him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so may Yahweh give us the strength to dwell on him fully, for him to dwell on us fully, us to dwell on him fully, that we might be a manifestation of Yahshua the Messiah and to all the world. And may Yahweh bless you, and may he have mercy on us all. Thank mm-hmm. you.